Whatever Valentine's Day might mean to you, it probably means something different to Solomon Rushdie. February 14th, 1989, that was the day Solomon's entire life was turned on his head. Sentenced to death by Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini. His crime, the Satanic Verses, a novel accused of insulting Islam and disrespecting the Prophet Muhammad. Forced into hiding, Solomon chose an alias from the names of his two favorite writers, Joseph Conrad and Anton Chekhov. And he lived under the threat of murder for almost a decade. When Iran eh, softened its stance on the fatwa, he emerged back into public life. He collaborated with you too. and adapted his epic novel, Midnight's Children, for the big screen and for Canadian director Deepa Mehta. At the precise instant of India's arrival at independence, on the stroke of midnight, I tumbled forth into the world. And now Salman finally tells the story of his years in hiding. It's a gripping new memoir called Joseph Anton. Salman Rushdie, everybody. <laughs> Nice to see you, sir. It was great to be back. Great to be back. Congratulations on two counts. So you got Midnight's Children, which is a film. Yep. And then there's your own book. I want to start with the book right. because it sort of sets up your life. Uh, for the longest time, certainly when I've interviewed you, you've written a novel, and then invariably your personal life comes up in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Now your book is your life. Yeah, I know. Well, for a long time, it used to frustrate me because. You know, I would write these books, which were fiction, and I came, you know, I'd spent years writing them, and I'd come to talk about them, and people always wanted to ask about those dark years, you know. And, and, and then I thought, eventually, I don't know, I just threw a switch in my head, you know, and I just thought, okay, you want to hear about it? Here's everything. Right. You know, and after this, I think if anybody ever asks me about it again, <laughs> I'm just going to, like, throw a 600-page book at them <laughs> and say, read that. Your life fell apart. It did. It did. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. You know, if you, <laughs> if you, if you could possibly avoid being sentenced to death by the tyrannical, right. fanatical head of a foreign power, you know, that avoid it if you can. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just what, what's so bizarre is that it's in this era, it's so much easier to get that sentence these days you know, than not, exactly. right? Exactly. You know, it's it, it's happening. It is unfortunately happening more often now. Well, one of the reasons why they call them the nonfiction novel, though, is because they, there's a, there's some sort of reticence to call it a memoir because the audience distrusts the authenticity of every story now. Yeah, well, also because there have been people who've played stupid games with memoirs, you know, yeah. where, where they've uh, made things up and tried to pass them off as the truth, and it somewhat debased the form. Right. Um, I think you have to lie to tone it down. Yeah, I mean, this is, yes, it, that, that, re that really is the truth. I mean, there are stuff, there are things that happened which it's very, I mean, if it weren't for the fact that they're true, you wouldn't believe that they happened, right. you know, and, and, uh, and that's why I thought there's no point fictionalizing this. You know, don't write a novel based on this experience because the thing that makes it interesting is that it's true, you know, um, and, uh, and so there it is. I mean, there's, I didn't make anything up, really. What I didn't have to make anything up. It's, uh, unfortunately, what happened to me is that my life sort of turned into a thriller, you know, it sort of turned into a spy novel, and suddenly I had men with guns in the kitchen, you know, and I was being taken for meetings to that building that you've seen in James Bond movies on the River Thames with where Judy Dench is inside, right. you know, running the British intelligence services. And what did you learn about loyalty during that time? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked, because I think one of the big themes in the book is friendship, because I think I was really lucky in that I turned out to have an incredibly loyal uh, group of friends uh, around me who, I mean, I think that's the reason I'm sitting here and kind of reasonably in one piece, is that they were so, they were, they were not just, pra they were practically supportive, but they were also emotionally supportive, and they were sort of politically supportive, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and they helped me come through it, really. And so I think I came to think of this as a battle between love and hate in some way, you know, that, and, and, uh, and I think that the, the love that was around me is the thing that helped me keep the hatred at bay. Did this rob you of some material? Um, no, I think it gave me so. I mean, actually, now I actually feel there's a bit of me, you know, because writers are curious, crazy, diseased people. There, there's a bit of me which there's a bit of me which thinks, you know, now it's my book. Yeah. You know, okay, you did all that to me, but now I own it because it's in my book. And I thought at least I got a book out of it. 
<laughs> you did. I'm not sure it was worth the expense. <laughs> no, no, as I said, if possible, avoid. You know, but but uh, but given that you had to go through it, you may as well come out of it with a book. So you, you maintain a sense of humor throughout this experience, did you? You know, there were things that happened all the way through that that my family and friends and I we would say to each other that you know if this stuff wasn't if it weren't for the fact that this is not funny at all, right. it would be quite funny. Right. You know? and, and there was there were moments like that all the way through. Let me play this clip from Seinfeld. This is a, oh, a, yeah. know, a moment from Seinfeld. Watch this. <laughs> you know who I saw at the health club? Salmon Rushdie. <laughs> I, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> Salmon Rushdie. Oh, well, I could see that. You got five million Muslims after you. You want to stay in pretty good shape. It's a great show. Yeah. It's a funny show. Was this ever funny to you when you saw it this It was stuff? funny. I mean, I thought, you know, if, if you're going to be on Seinfeld, I hope it's a good joke, you know. <laughs> and, and, I mean, years and years later, many years later, I met him in New York, and he was quite nervous. Jerry was? Yeah, he said, did you, did you see that, that episode you know, we did about you? And I said, yes, I saw it. And he said, well, did you think it was okay? And, and then I sort of said, yes, I actually did think it was very good. And he was re very relieved. When did you see it? How, how, uh, much later. Oh, much, much later, okay. Much later. I didn't see it at the time. But, you know, there was a moment when American sitcoms couldn't stop making references to me. There was a moment in the very late episodes of Cheers, if you could believe this, that I was, I mean, again, I wasn't there, but I was in the storyline of Cheers. And there was a moment in one of the last episodes of The Golden Girls, that's how you know you've made it, by the way. You know, <laughs> Never mind a fatwa, yeah. B. Arthur. You know, but in the, in the hotel, you know, there were people yeah. always saying, I saw Salman Rushdie, he's just upstairs. Yeah. And the people would go up and they'd say, no, he just went downstairs. And so I was, I've been, you know, That's, I've been everywhere. What a bizarre out of body that is, though, right? You know, who could think that Did, I would end up with the Golden Girls? When you were, <laughs> well, not I. <laughs> when you were in that moment, did you ever imagine your own death? All the time. I mean, I thought at the beginning, I thought it was going to be really very soon, you know? And uh, it's a strange thing to have to live with. There are people out there who feel like, as much as you strive for tolerance for all the religions, there is a certain feeling that there is a section of all religions that are extremist. Yeah. But within Islam, there's a, it's just it's, it's, it's a bad moment right now, there's no question. I mean, I think that, and I think, you know, the people in many ways, some of the people who suffer most from this are, are other Muslims, you know? I mean, the people who, were most oppressed by the Taliban were the people of Afghanistan. And the same is true about the, the Ayatollahs, you know, the people who suffer most are the people of Iran. And in this Sunni-Shia conflict in Iraq, you know, it's Muslims killing other Muslims. So, uh, but I do think it's something that the Muslim world has to look at and put its house in order because it's in real danger of allowing the fanatics to define what the culture is. I heard you say that Islam needs to find its secular humanity. Well, you know, I think what happened in, in last year in, in the so-called Arab Spring is that that's what was being expressed. You know, I mean, what those young people were talking about was not religion. They were talking about freedom and jobs. They were talking about a better future and more personal liberty. And so you can see that that desire is there. You know, unfortunately, for the moment at least, it seems to have got hijacked by yet another bunch of religious extremists. And military, in Egypt. And military, yeah. So, but underneath that, the people haven't changed. The people still want what they expressed last year, and I hope they managed to get it. Here's a great writer from our time who's passed not that long ago. Yeah. The thesis of the book is that it's going to be a choice between civilization and religion, and that the enemies of civilization, the, the theocrats, and the religious fanatics, really mean it this time. I think it's a race between us and them. I think it's quite possible that they will succeed in destroying the world. The great Chris Hitchens. Yeah, well, that, that, well, he's, as you know, he's one of my very closest friends, so um, it's a great, I mean, it's a great loss for me, but I think it's a great loss for all of us because of that extraordinary mind. What's interesting is that Christopher and you weren't close friends before, that he became friends during your struggle, we right? We became much closer, yeah. I mean, I knew him before and was friendly, but, you know, we weren't, like, he wasn't one of my closest buddies. But right. when this thing happened to me, he was so outraged and uh, aroused by it. And, you know, Christopher is a street fighter. You know, so you give him a, give him a fight, he's going to jump in with both feet. And, and I thought, if you're in a fight, you want him on your side. Right. You know, you certainly, you certainly don't want him on the other side.
Let's talk about Midnight's Children. So this is an interesting book. It's your yeah. second book, right? My second novel, yeah. It's yeah. your second one, it's the first one. First one, not very good. So it's really the first, first, first one that's okay. But this one took you a long time to get to from when you left school. It was about 13 yes. years. Yes, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, 13 years from when I graduated Cambridge, yeah. Why do you think it took so long to get to Because this is truly a story that feels like your voice. Well I, well, I think I had to find my voice. I think that's it, you know. And I think for those of us who are migrants, you know, who start in one world and end up in another, and, that business of finding your feet and finding out how, how to talk and, and discovering what are your ways to tell your stories, it's not automatic in the, same, in the way that it is if you're deeply rooted in one place, you grow up and you write about that place. Right? Right. So I think it just took me a while to find direction. It's really good to see you, man. Thanks so much yeah, for coming. You too. I really right. appreciate that. Sound the rest of both Joseph Antoine. That's the memoir right there. And the film, really cool, called Midnight's Children. We're back.